You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Burs Puya. In this week's program, we'll be discussing the 35th anniversary of the massacre of political prisoners in Iran. We'll interview Yossaman Bayani on this issue. The shocking news of the week is from Aceh province in Indonesia and a curfew on women after 11 p.m. The insane fatwa is from the UAE and how you're not allowed to go to Mars. Uh, the good news is um, about a uh, Syrian woman who threw away the burger to show that they are free from ISIS. We also have uh, a letter of the week. We're going to be responding to a viewer, a viewer on whether we should be respecting people's beliefs or not. Stay with us. From 20th June 1981, the Islamic regime attacked and executed hundreds of people a day. They closed down newspapers and crushed the opposition. This was the point of the Islamic Republic's establishment, not the 1971 Iranian Revolution. Many don't remember this day, but it's an important moment in the formation of the Islamic Republic. We must remind today's generation that the regime is the result of a massive crime against humanity. This must be remembered, recorded, stated, exposed and not forgotten, especially since many of those who organized the murders and killings still run the country. 20th June 1981 is a day that a lot of people will never ever forget. It's one of those days where you start hearing about people just being rounded up and arrested and often being executed that very same day with very sham trials of possibly five minutes, if at all. I remember those dark days uh, very clearly. Um, um, every day we would listen to uh, BBC Persian service or um, I Iranian uh, radio, um, as well as reading the newspapers. Every day we were receiving shocking news, right? continuous bombardment of horrible news, you know, a layer of intelligence, you know, a layer, you know, you could hear famous poets, uh, intellectuals, students, uh, um, you know, a whole generation of uh, Iranian sort of, um, but a different age group, they were massacred by the Islamic regime. And also, I mean, a lot of them were buried in mass graves. Uh, some of their families have never really seen even where they're buried. Khavaran, which is what the regime called the place of the damned, is, is really a, a, a wonderful place for many who want to commemorate and remember these beloved who've been killed. And they go and mark this anniversary by going to, this, uh, to their grave sites, yeah. these mass graves. Uh, and we, we must remember, uh, these people were the best of the Iranian society. These are people who wanted a better Iranian society. And there were, you know, the opposition to the Islamic regime, who was new and were trying to organize itself, was immense. And, um, and sort of, it was gaining power in Iran in opposition to the Islamic regime. It took a year, and suddenly the Islamic regime turned the, you know, the nasty, the fascist, um, you know, the fascism of the Islamic regime suddenly came out. What we see today in, as pra what ISIS is practicing, it was in Iran was practiced in a very short period and the massacre thousands upon thousands of people many of those people we never uh, know, would know the names um, and the, the thing is that the Iranian society psychologically hasn't got over that and there is a, a deep demand for the truth to come out and that's why every year people remember it is international sort of everywhere there are protests and uh, this Iranian society is not going is not going to forget this and also I mean one of the things we talked about earlier in another uh, program is about Iran tribunal which is basically people who've survived yes. uh, or have grievances against the regime for loved ones killed uh, have uh, you know went to a tribunal a sort of mock tribunal like the Russell tribunal and uh, judges found the Iranian regime guilty of crimes against humanity for that period. And of course, there, there have been other periods as well, but it is a very, very crucial period in Iranian history. Absolutely. And I think um, it seems that everybody in the psyche of the Iranian sort of population, every, everybody is waiting for the moment for the truth to come out. What happened in those days? In those days? We know what happened in those days, but at the same time, people who actually committed those crimes need to 
take responsibility, they need to be brought to justice. No revenge, I mean that's one of the key, no revenge. But people justice. Don't, they, people want justice, yeah. not revenge. I will now go to an interview with Yasaman Bayoni, who's a rights activist. I mean, you know, she lost many friends and loved ones during this time. Her sister as well, and she talks about how, you know, her mother never received the body of her sister, and they assume that she was buried in Khawaran, what the regime calls the place of the damned. But it is a wonderful place for those of us who want to commemorate um, the, the, the resistance and people who were never defeated by this regime. Stay with us. Hello Yassi, welcome to Bread and Roses. I wanted to ask you about 30th uh, of Khordad, which is the 20th of June. What's the significance of this date? Um, the reason we uh, commemorate this day every year for the last uh, more than 30 years, or I would say 33 years, is uh, because uh, in that year, the newly established uh, Islamic Republic of Iran started a vicious attack by um, arresting hundreds and hundreds of activists on the street from demonstrations, from their homes, and then attacking uh, houses, attacking uh, different organizations, and then um, executing many, many activists and publishing their names in daily newspapers in hundreds across Iran. And uh, during that time, by the numbers published by Amnesty International, during a very short brief time, uh, less than a couple of years, uh, at least names of over 2,500 people are known, but the real numbers are in tens of thousands because many names were not published. Many people were killed in, uh, in, uh, under torture. So this is a very important attack by the newly established Islamic Republic of Iran, the government, um, on any, any kind of opposition. And that's why we we never the government was uh, never responded to these atrocities. The the people who were executed, many of them were buried uh, in mass graves, and uh, many of them are our classmates from university, from factories, from our families, immediate members of families. So this is really significant for us that after over 30 years this almost close to or maybe genocide of Iranian dissidents uh, has not been uh, ever responded by that government and we really need to keep this this memory alive so we ask the uh, the government or anybody who comes to power in Iran to respond to these atrocities what was your own personal experience during that time uh, I um, I was horrified. Uh, it was like uh, when you went on the streets. I remember I was I was on the street. If you were suspicious, the paramilitary, the um, Islamic paramilitary, would just come and uh, grab you, arrest you, and they would take you to uh, to prison. And many people were. Uh, executed right after those arrests, uh, even not with their real name known, uh, because many of them didn't want to give their name. So many people were uh, being, uh, it, it was a reign of terror uh, so that the government is able to establish and to get rid of any kind of protest or any dissident. So, so my personal uh, experience is uh, one of horror and something I need to keep alive so that it's not repeated because we know that these experiences are unfortunately repeated over and over. So by remembering and uh, keeping the 
uh, people who are doing these atrocities, the government who are doing these atrocities, accountable. We hope that to prevent these kind of atrocious acts by the government of Iran or any any government per se. Do you uh, remember any specific story of someone you knew or yourself um, during this time, uh, just so people can get a sense of exactly what sort of things happened to individuals? So individuals were uh, like, uh, for example, my sister was um, a medical student uh, in from University of Tabriz, and she was arrested. We never uh, had any opportunity to, my family had never uh, able to see her at any prison. Uh, she was uh, arrested like a few days after, uh, like a couple of weeks after uh, the severe oppression started in uh, in uh, in June and then she was within two months she was executed and so many people were executed who were people who were protesting on June 20th and 24th they were many people young people were arrested and they were executed early in the morning and uh, families never found out where they are. So there are thousands and thousands of families. We could say that millions of Iranian, including the extended families, who each have a member who were executed during that time. And uh, uh, so these are really, really uh, fresh memories for many Iranians. At the same time, the government tried to keep it quiet. So you're able to talk to millions of other Iranians who don't even hurt, they don't even know about these atrocities. So it's, it's just like an ongoing um, effort for all of us to keep this alive. And just, just a reminder of all those people who were like my sister, like many, many of my classmates in university, or even from high school, who were, who had to go through a very short period of uh, um, some of them who had a trial, and then their name published under acting uh, against the government of uh, Allah. That's that was indeed one of the. Uh, things written in the newspaper, official one of the official newspaper. My sister, along with many, many hundred other people, they acted against the government of Allah, and that was so ambiguous. Uh, who is the government of Allah, and why should be people um, tortured, executed within hours, within days, with Islamic trials? Who? may not even last a minute. So these are the harsh reality for for millions in Iran. Do uh, you, you know where your sister's buried? And if you can tell people about Khavaran as well. Uh, Khavaran is, uh, is a cemetery in southern Tehran. And uh, it used to be a place to bury people who were um, like from Buddhists, like few Buddhists who lived in Iran. So it was like a fringe, fringe uh, uh, cemetery. And because uh, my sister and hundreds, thousands of other dissidents uh, were not, uh, or, or they, they were ex-Muslim, they, uh, they, uh, they were communists, uh, they were not allowed to be buried in the regular cemetery like Behesh de Zahra or other Muslim cemeteries, so-called Muslim cemeteries. And they were buried in mass graves in, in Khavaran. And of course, they were buried uh, clandestinely, like at in midnight. But families were there all the time. Families were monitoring. And they were, after these, um, these forces of torture, the agents of the government left, families would dig in and they would realize that some of them were not, they didn't have any bullet wound on their bodies. So they were actually killed under torture. They, they had no sign. So this is the talks I had with many families who, who had said that our child was not 
uh, killed by death squad or by by shooting at them they were killed in a different way so uh, under torture because there was no coroner's report or anything like that like family had to do the work themselves and um, I mean Khawaran has a very special place doesn't it for people I mean people go there every year to commemorate those buried there that's that's correct and it is an ongoing effort by the families and it is uh, an ongoing oppression by the government and the milit uh, and the police force to prevent families to to go there they even wanted to bulldoze there they already bulldozed part of it so for me there may not be ever any chance to go and find my sister's remains by any dna uh, testing or anything like that, but we know that they're buried there. And the government never told us where, where they buried the bodies. That, that information was never given to, to my mother, who, who actively uh, went prison by prison to find out what happened. Thank you. You're welcome. We hope you enjoyed that wonderful interview with Yosaman Bayoni. Before we move on to the next segment, we do want to tell you about two wonderful uh, books and films about this period in Iranian history. One is a book called Children of the Jacaranda Tree. It's by Sahar Delijani. She was actually in her mom's tummy when her mom was arrested, and she was born in prison, which is the story of many, many uh, women. Um, and children during that period. There's also a book by Nima Sarvestani, a and film. it's called, a film, sorry, it's called Those Who Said No. We're going to show a short trailer of it, and it really shows the depths of the crime during that time. <laughs> حتی دادگاهی شدن حتی در اون تخت شکنجه شدن تو تخت بهدری و همونجا بعدش زندانی رو میبردن و ادام میکردن روی برانکار شاید فردا قدر این نسل تونسته بشه نسلی که تو سیاه تر این روزهای میهنه ها از همه چیش گذاشت مستر پریزیدنت distinguished members of this tribunal. In the dark summer of 1988, by tapping on the cold walls of their cells, prisoners in the go hard establishment spread the news of the arrival of the mysterious death commission. Today, they can speak to this court without fear as the Iranian people listen and await historic justice. Look, the name of you is the person who is in the year 1967 was arrested in the prison in the prison. Now, there is a chance for you to defend yourself. Now, you are in the prison. I am not in the prison, but if I was in the prison, I couldn't be able to get the prison to the prison. You are in the prison, you are in the prison. موسیقی سوار میری بوس کردن و بردن سر محلی که اعدام میکنم من پشت اون پاسداری که بایستاده بودم 
اون طرفش یه پسر یه پسر بچه واقعا میتونم بگم سیزده سالش نبود چارده سالش نبود بچه بود بو محمدی الان رئیس سازمان بازرسی کل کشوره خب ما اولین باری که هم دیگر دیدیم توی دادگاه بود اون جز به حیات بود من هم محتمی که کجا حاضر شده بودن و راجع به جون هم داشتن تصمیم میگرفتن خب حالا این دفعه در واقع توی اجلاس جهانیه میبیننش خب چرا یه همچین کسی که دست و جنایت علیه بشریت داشته راحت میتونه بیاد تو اجلاس های بین و مللی به اینجا و بره گفتن که دستمونو بذاریم روی دست باز داره و این انگوشتمون روی انگوشتی که ما شده من کار کردم و بعد دست رو شنی کنم و شنی شد Shocking news of the week is from Indonesia's Aceh province and what's happened is that women after 11 p.m. are no longer allowed to go out without being accompanied by a male guardian or husband. That's uh, amazing. This is another attack on women's right and you always see these reactionary religious uh, groups behind it. Um, and you know what, what they want they want to say look we're looking after women we don't want them to be threatened but in reality they are uh, you know put them in a very inferior position uh, and they are pretending there is there, there is the issue of safety but it isn't actually attacking women because a lot of people working at that time they work in restaurants and bars they are trying to push them back into mm. home and it's interesting they always use this thing of that they're trying to protect women this is the excuse the iranian regime gives for example when it denies women access ISIS to stadium does it, it? isis does it they all do it they're all yes. one and the same and basically it is to push women out of the public space and one of the things that one of the officials has said which is in my opinion a, a threat it says that it may lead to sexual harassment and sexual violence and there's nothing they can do because they're basically saying that women who do work or go out at this time are getting what they deserve. Absolutely. And that's always justification for this. And I think this needs to be condemned. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the reality of the matter is, is that, you know, women should be allowed to travel fr freely, to move freely without any sort of curfews and impositions. And this is just one more example of Sharia rules, Islamic rules on the lives of women. There's a fatwa from the UAE which says that those who want to go to Mars will commit a sin and it shouldn't be allowed. And these are for people who might apply to then go, you know, be part of the first group of people going to Mars. And what's interesting is they say it's so, so haz hazardous, you know, they don't want people to go through such a hazardous journey. And I guess it's because they prefer to have them here so they can kill them. <laughs> absolutely. And have them um, at reach. Absolutely. You know, I think uh, uh, they're against science, they're against happiness. Mars exploration, it just advances human science. And why, there's why no not? Islamists on Mars. Oh, I like it. Possibly that's why. <laughs> I want to no, go to Mars. <laughs> I think I've, the thing is that it shows that there is no God. It shows that the, the religion, you know, advancement of science actually undermines everything that I was saying. That's why I think deep down they don't like any, any of these things. Um, I wonder what they thought of people going to moon. Hmm. They never said anything, did they? Hmm. No. But what, what's funny is they've said that there's no righteous reason for someone to go on this uh, mission because it will kill themselves, which means that there are good reasons to kill yourself. Um, it's called suicide yes, bombing. Yes. That's fine. Yes. But going to Mars where, you know, your life might be at risk is not looked 
at favorably. Well, I think we should just forget about what they said and carry <laughs> on with the Mars mission. Go and what, to Mars. And, and what's great is there's obviously, um, I think, 500 people who've applied from Saudi Arabia to go on the Mars mission and from other Arab countries. So there's a huge demand, relatively And they speaking. are ignoring the fatwas. Yeah. Now, the good news, or shall we say fantastic news uh, for this week, is the moment was captured in a mm. photo that women escaping from the areas under control of ISIS, they were throwing away their burger, and you know, they, they, you, you could see the freedom in, in the body movement and the fact that they were throwing things. And the just, colors, the colors that were underneath their burgers, and bright colors, absolutely. happy colors. And all these sort of people who, are, um, who actually argue for uh, Islamic dress mm. as a culture, as all people want it. Mm. That moment I, I destroyed if, every argument. Yeah, I, think. I wonder if these feminists want to go there and say, you know, that's the right to dress. You need to put that back on. Put it back on. You're you're violating your cultural yes. traditions. And I think I, I think it was a brilliant moment. I, it was I, you brilliant. Know, sometimes these moments just they mm. capture, you know, a lot, yeah. and it destroys a whole lot of arguments against you know freedom of women to dress and the fact that we, everybody knows that burqa, chador, hijab, Islamic dress is imposed, is compulsory, is actually brought by sheer force and, and brutality and yeah. people actually don't want it. I mean this is one of the things we always say is that you know when they say people have the right to dress we say well what they're wearing underneath is their dress yes. and if you look at the dresses of these women we're going to show pictures on the screen it is just you know these are one of those photographs that speak a million words not even a thousand words they are so wonderful because you see that blackness and that bleakness of isis being removed and just color and and life you know um shining through so this is really good news for us and we were celebrating after we saw those photos Now, as you know, we are now going to be addressing a question or comment from our viewers in every program. And this week, we're going to be addressing a question posed by Mehdi, who has written to us in Persian about how he enjoys our program, but that he thinks that we should not be criticizing people's beliefs and opinions. Or oh, undermining it. I mean, one of the characteristics of this program is, and I think part of the free thinking sort of uh, um, approach to life is that nothing is sacred and everything is subject to doubt, questioning and criticism and that's part and parcel of human progress. As soon as you start limiting you know, the ability to question, you've lost the game. But also, I mean, the reality is that people's beliefs are not all homogeneous. Not everybody and agrees. It's not fixed. It's not fixed. People can change their minds. People can leave religion. People can become rationalists, and so on and so forth. And so, even he likes our program, but he's worried that we are disrespecting people's beliefs. And I think this is not about disrespecting people. Beliefs are thoughts. You need to fight it. You need to challenge it. We fight on ideas all the time, mm -hmm. you know, we, we do <laughs> on ideas all the time, but the respect is there. I think that, that's the key. We respect people, ideas are subject to criticism, doubt, attack, mm. you name it. It's, it's out there. We'll be at it for a long time, but we respect every human being. And that's the, uh, there's, there's that good quote which says, I respect you too much as a human being to respect your ridiculous beliefs. Yes. And so, you know, in a sense, it is important to carry on that challenge. Before we go, I'd like to remind you of two important dates. One is the 17th of June, which is a day of action in support of Raif Badawi and his lawyer, Walid Abu Khair. It is a day to put attention on their cases and to put pressure on the Saudi government to release them immediately. We also want to remind you, dear viewers, that Ramadan is coming soon and we will, as we did last year, drink and celebrate uh, 
in defense of all those who break fasting rules at risk to themselves. And I think really, I mean, I, I know we disagree with this. I, I am calling, and I'm sure you support me on this, Mariam, for people to join us. We did this last year. We are asking people to join us in solidarity with people who actually are suffering on a daily basis under the Islamic sort of rules and regulation and restriction imposed. You know, I, I think that's important for us to spread this as a form of resistance and we'll break fast every day of Ramadan because to show solidarity with the people who actually are suffering. Mm. And of course there are groups of young people in particular in places like Morocco and Tunisia who do this and who go on, uh, on picnics and are sometimes beaten by the police and arrested and this is something we need to continue doing. Well, we've reached the end of our program. We hope you did enjoy the program. We want to remind you about our Patreon site. We've got 17 patrons now. One more. One more, so we're very excited. Let's let's keep moving. Is it, is, let's is keep this, moving up. Is this new? This is my new thing. Okay, all right. Okay. <laughs> so we hope you had a good program. Time, yeah. yeah, enjoyed it. And we hope to see you again, same time, same place next week. Bye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discussed taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.